turn with me to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1, and we want to look at, this is part 2 of last week's sermon as we look at our identity. The sermon title is, How Do You Self-Identify? And I want you to think about that for a second. I'm not trying in any way to be controversial, but this is an issue that is, even this week, it's been in the news. If you watch our military, our Congress vote on how people can gender identify, um, I told you last week, I don't recommend you look up. Uh, don't, don't recommend you Google um, self-identity because you'd be amazed. Some, as I told you, some people try to identify as wolves and so on and so forth and so, so have it. But here's the thing that I'm going to challenge you with today. What I'm going to teach you from God's Word this morning was one of the most, other than salvation, one of the most life-changing truths I ever learned. And so, with that, how do you identify? Here's what I know. I know that some of you may identify on Sunday as Baptist, and then the rest of the week you identify as something else. It's wrong. And it'll cause you a struggle that's just not winnable. Okay? And so the question is, if I were to ask you, and there's great fear and trembling I can feel because I'm right here with you, right? And I'm not going to pick on anybody. Well, not more than a handful, anyway. But if I were to come to you this morning and say, who are you? Tell me who you are. There'd be a lot of ways that you identify. But I want you to listen to what God has to say about who we are. Because God values us above everybody else. And you will struggle all your life until you, until you realize, who are you? you? You've got to answer that question. How do you self-identify? We talked about it last week. We looked at trying to identify with, with modern culture, which is you look within. Therefore, you go in. You're dependent upon your emotions. You're dependent on looking for self-worth uh, of your own making. And then the modern way that we've done for hundreds of years, or the traditional way, rather, that we've done for hundreds of years is to identify ourselves based on how others relate to us. The only problem with that is it's dependent upon how others value you, how much value you, you will be worth. The greater question is to look Godward. The greater answer is found looking Godward to identify yourself. So if you have your Bibles, I want you to read with me Philippians chapter 1, verses 3 through 10, and then we'll look at verse 21. Paul says, I thank my God in all remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for you all making my prayer with joy. Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, and I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all because I told you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. Look at verse 21 of the same chapter. Paul says about his own life, for me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. So here's what I want to ask you again this morning. How do you self-identify? Today we would, you would say, well, I'm, I'm a good Baptist. I'm here on Sunday, right in the middle of vacation season. You know, the lake is beautiful this morning. Preacher, we're right here. It's only going to take you so far. And that will prove empty after a while. Problematic. Monday you may identify as a, a supervisor or a mother or a father. And all those things have important roles in our lives. But the greater question is, where is your source of worth? What makes you valuable? If you look at 
looking inward. As we said last week, I want you to think about what I told you last week. So much so, to tie the two together, I want to go back and refresh your memory. And there's some things that I didn't point out last week that I, I want you to really think about. What I want you to do this morning is, is I want you to listen. Open your heart to God's Word. The truth of God's Word. Your Creator. But if you're looking inward, if you're choosing how to value yourself, your own tag, if you will, the problem with that is, as your emotions change, there comes confusion, frustration, self-loathing, and ultimately a lack of self-worth. That's why there's such an epidemic of suicides in the younger generation. Because if you're looking inward to value yourself, as your emotions change, the way you value yourself drastically changes also. There's even, you know, if you look outward as we talked about traditional ways, it's better, but again, it, it depends on how valuable you are to someone else if you're looking to someone else to find your own value. It's dependent on how others write your work. Whether it's in marriage, whether it's in vocation, or whatever relationship you have. The only real sure and perfect way to find self-worth is to look up. Is to look up. Because when you look to God to find your self-worth, it's not desire-based, which can change. It's not performance-based, which does change. But it is God-based. You know, we talked last week, even if you look to your parents, that's the big move of the last 15 years is for parents to somehow help their children find a sense of self-worth. For parents somehow to help their children grow up with sound egos. Problem with that is, is once they reach the age when they're beginning to go out and trying to become adults. If you disappoint your parents, what happens when they no longer approve of your choices? None of those things are sure ways to find your own self-worth. But if it is God-based, it's incredibly different, incredibly solid. It's not achieved, but it's given by God, it's received. Listen to what the Bible says in Philippians 3, 8, 9. We looked at this last week. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. For His sake I've suffered the loss of all things. And Paul says, I count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in Him. That's important. Not having righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Our identity is not achieved, it's given by Christ. Paul is saying, listen, all the things that I once counted as important and got my values, my self-identity from, the law, uh, my position in the government, my position in, the, in religion, he said, they're rubbish. All that counts is my position in Christ. And see, we're able to ask the Father. I want you to listen very closely to this. You're able to ask God to accept you, to adopt you, and to unite with you. We're going to look a little bit today about adoption and how incredible it is. We've had families in our church that have adopted several children, a couple families. And we'll talk more about it, but there's nothing, no outside source. You don't have an internal source that can bring value to you like God can bring value to you. Because it's not based on performance. It's not based on your moral effort. But it's based on a gift from God. Amen. Listen to what... Paul said in Romans, that the one who does not work but believes in him, who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Just as David 
also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. Your, your value is not based on your past, your present, nor your achievements in the future, nor your failures. But it's on Christ alone. Now, I want you to listen to what I told you last week. I'm not sure if you picked up on it. We're going to dive into it a little bit more. Why did Jesus primarily come to the earth? Now, I know a lot of you may have heard this preached over the years. And what I'm asking you today, because you're going to say, and sometimes you say, but preacher, I heard this, and you say this, and it's different from what I heard. Be open to God's word. You change it out. But why did Jesus primarily come? It's why, I know what the intention of WWJD was years ago, but it had such a damaging effect on the church. Jesus' primary reason for coming to the earth was not to show us how to live. It was not to show us how to be moral. He did. He did. Yes, we have an example for our lives, but that was not his primary reason. His primary reason for coming was to live the life that you could not live. That I cannot live. And his primary reason was come, for coming was to die in our place the death that we deserve to die. And so when we rest in Him alone for salvation, He becomes our substitute. He becomes our representative with God. Because on the cross, Jesus was treated the way you and I deserve to be treated. And when we believe in Him, listen to this, we're treated like He deserves to be treated. We become royalty when we place our faith in Him. Do you see that your value, it doesn't come from within you. Your value doesn't come from whether someone else places value on you or your moral accomplishments, your value comes from a relationship with Jesus Christ only. He brings value to you when you trust Him. See, all religions are not equal. I said that last week, but I want you to think through this. Every religion you know other than true Christianity requires moral performance out of the believer. Every religion. You name it. Some that name themselves as Christians or Christianity is not the true gospel. Every religion requires that, you, that there's some type of moral performance in you. You're expected to achieve your own salvation through some moral effort or some observance. What does that mean, preacher? That's what I talked about. Some of you are here today because you're Baptist and you're supposed to be here on Sunday. Whatever you do, don't get your value for being a Baptist. Others come to church for moral observances. I got news for you. I'm a Baptist 100% through and through because of what we believe. Because we believe the Bible. Because that's God's word to us. And I believe that baptism is very, very important. But baptism will not bring value to you. Nor salvation. Nor any other religious observance. Stay with me. Only value and salvation is found in Jesus Christ. A personal relationship with Him. Here's something that should blow your mind. In Jesus Christ, when you adore Him and when you love Him, He adores you. He loves you. Listen, how much does He adore you? We read this last week, but I want you to think about it. 
Can you imagine Jesus giving up all the rights, privileges of heaven? To come live a life you couldn't live and to come for a debt you could not pay that is owed to God for you on the cross? That's how you know he loves you. That's how you know he adores you. Listen to what the Bible says. Philippians 2, 1-11. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord of one mind, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves, that each of you look not only to his own interests, but also the interests of others. So what does that mean, preacher? That means the rat race that a lot of us are caught up in trying to get our value from our jobs, our careers, our bank accounts, and all the other things that we try to do. Paul is saying that's not the Christian way. Wow. He's not saying we all have to be poor paupers living in a, a, a tin hut somewhere. He's describing the differences between those of you that are drawing yourself worth and your salvation from Jesus and Jesus alone and what that looks like. You don't have to compete with the Joneses down the street for, for your self-worth if it is in Christ. That's what he's describing here. Verse 5. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, he was God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself of all his rights and privileges. By taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore, because of that, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Do you know what that means? It means he valued you above everything else. That's incredible. The second part of the sermon on self-identity is this. Finding freedom and value through a relationship with Jesus Christ. As we've discussed, neither modern nor traditional or even ordinary moralistic religion can compete with finding your value through Christ. Here's what ordinary religion says. I live a good moral life, therefore God accepts me. Do you know what one of the biggest eye-opening cultural shocks for our new youth pastor is? Josh. And I'm so glad he caught it. He's caught it in the first month. He's learned it, picked up on it. Because I've been trying to tell him and, and, and his, his eyes have been opened. You know what the greatest lying fallacy that most people in the Bible Belt live by. That we're Christians are saved by association. You see, it was very clear in New Jersey it lost or saved. You talk to a person, not a believer. Believer, not a believer, believer. You see, but when you talk to a person in the Bible Belt and you begin to talk about spiritual things and their condition and their relationship with God, they immediately begin to refer you to the church they attend every Christmas and Easter or whether they've been baptized or not baptized or what observances they do. But that's not where you find your self-identity. That's religion. And I'll be honest with you. There's nothing much freeing from that nor of that. Okay? Okay? True Christianity, gospel Christianity, it operates the exact opposite of that. Here's the statement I made. I live a good moral life, therefore God accepts me. True gospel is the opposite of that. Okay? The gospel is this. God accepts me unconditionally in Jesus Christ. Therefore, I live a good moral life. Do you understand or are you confused? There's pollen out there. I can't really see your faces. My 
eyes are all gunked up, but I, I can see by your body language you're saying, you know what you just said? No. Religion says, I lived a good moral life, therefore God accepts me. But the true gospel is this. God accepts me because of my relationship with Jesus Christ. Therefore, because I have a relationship with Jesus, I live a good moral life. Because I've been changed. Because I've been born again. See, in the first case, you can live a good life out of a hope of some reward coming to you at the end. But with that life, that's a life of depending on religion. It's filled with insecurity. It's filled with self-doubt. I've heard a lot of preachers say, listen, you should never, never let anybody, never ask anybody to question their salvation. Well, there's just one problem with that. It's called the Bible. Paul said to always examine yourself to see whether you're in the faith or not. I'm asking you this morning, is your salvation, are you, are you thinking you're doing a good job for God and at the end you're hoping He's going to reward you? All that leads to is insecurity. Constant doubt. If you truly surrender your heart and your life to Jesus Christ and you're trusting nothing or no one else for salvation, there's real freedom in that. <coughs> there's always going to be a lingering question if you're trusting religion or something else. Will I ever be good enough for this reward? See, in the second life, the one where you have a real relationship with Jesus it's not filled with fear, but it's filled with joy. You live a life to please and resemble the one who saved you. That's the problem I had with all the WWJD bracelets that went around. In their intention, they were great. But Jesus Christ didn't come to earth to show you how to live and be moral so that you can live and be moral enough, maybe, to get a reward when you die. Came to earth to die in your place. To give you true freedom. To set you free. To give you a new heart. To give you a new life. WWJD won't get you into heaven. But if you are trusting only in Christ. You already are in heaven. You already are a member of there's a huge difference. If you're trusting religion or some kind of religious observance you've done, some ritual, you're always wondering, will it be good enough to get the reward? But if you're trusting Christ alone, the Bible teaches us that you already are a citizen of heaven. Hey, I'm not sure, Pastor. Go back and read the first. <laughs> Do it later. We'll look at chapter 1, verse 1 of the same book we're reading. Philippians. Paul refers to the Philippians as saints. Not what they will be, but what they are. Because of their relationship with Jesus Christ. See, if you are trusting Christ and Christ alone, you don't have to coerce God. For some kind of reward. You don't have to coerce Him for, to love you. You serve Him because He already loves you. Let's talk about all the other things that we do, the outward things that we do for self-worth. A lot of people pursue a career to find self-worth. Listen, I have four kids, and I always have pushed them, and I will always push them to be the best they can be and to excel. That's more about stewardship than it is finding your self-worth. And you remember we talked about the Joneses? The Joneses? Not the Joneses. The Jones up. There's nothing wrong with having a successful career unless that's where you find yourself worth. So many people pursue careers, status, names to find self-worth. But what you ought to do, remember I said I, I push my children? It's more about stewardship. Doing your best because of how God has blessed you and how He has rewarded you, how He has gifted you. Because of his love, not for his love. There's a huge difference. Let me give you a, a, an illustration. God has called every single one of us to be missionaries. 
And I, I remember when I was first saved, I've heard all the, the, uh, the sermons the preachers have preached about all the great missionaries in Africa. And I thank God for all the great missionaries. I have a lot of dear friends that I went to seminary with who were on the field. But the problem, the mistake, and I made this mistake as a young preacher, is you preach a sermon and talk about, hey, listen, God might be calling you to Africa, hoping someone would come out of the congregation and become a great missionary. And we put missionaries way up here on a pedestal. And I thank God for missionaries, for the sacrifices that they've given over the years. The problem with that is, is it makes them first-class citizens like us preachers, and you guys second-class citizens of heaven. That's not the truth of the gospel. The call is not for a couple of you to become missionaries. The gospel is not for a couple of you to become missionaries. The gospel is that God called every one of you to be missionaries. When you look at the sacrifices the African missionaries are making, or the missionaries to Africa are making, the question is, how about you? See, God, I believe, will call a missionary to a foreign land out of this congregation. But I know he's called every single one of you to be missionaries right here in Oconee. With the same devotion, the same love, the same dedication as any missionary would give to go to a foreign soul. But right here. He will, out of this congregation, call missionaries across the, the pond. But he has called every single one of us to be missionaries right here. We talked about <clears throat> God has a plan for every one of us. I played the little commercial last week, and if you didn't get it, here was the thing. The kid said, I've got a dream, I've got a dream. And the guy said, oh, somebody's already done that. And the kid looks to his parents who told him he could be anything in the world he wanted to be when he grows up. And I told you the problem with that is this. God has a plan for your life. Are you pursuing God's plan for your life? But now listen. God also has a way of working out you discovering his plan for your life through the desires, the gifts, the abilities that he gives you. It's a practical pursuit of what God's plan is for your life. But here's the major difference. I want you to follow with me. I believe some of you, God will call across the pond. I know that God's called all of you to this county to be missionaries. As dedicated, committed, and sacrificial as those that would go fly across the pond. God might call some of you here to the NFL. Nothing wrong with some of you desiring uh, those sports dreams or to play professional baseball or whatever. But the reality is most of us he's called the Senate, Oconee, Westminster, Wahala, most of us. But he's called all of us to be on mission. Every single one of us. Regardless of where you are. See, just because God may have you be a doctor or a lawyer or uh, work in a manufacturing plant or to be a professional ball player somewhere, every one of you are still called that calls his name to be a missionary. Doesn't mean that God's plan for your life won't be that some of you are doctors, lawyers, professional athletes, maybe you're going to be butchers, bakers, or candlestick makers, whatever. But you're first and foremost missionaries of the first missionary. The greatest missionary text in all the Bible, we read it. Philippians 2, when the great missionary left heaven in every comfort of heaven behind to come reach us. That's the greatest missionary. What does it mean for him to be the first priority in our lives? For our relationship with Jesus to be our number one priority? It means that your worth not found in your career. It's not found in anything other than your relationship with Jesus Christ. Your worth is not found in whether you whether you get a scholarship to play football at Clemson or be in the band at Clemson or wherever it is that God calls you. It's not found in whether you graduated college or you didn't graduate college, what your career is, but it's only found in relationship with Jesus Christ. That means whether you go on to or you don't go on to college. Whether you chase a thick skin or you don't chase a thick skin or whether you work in some other vocation, whatever it is, 
If Christ is number one in your life, it's all right. If you go on to play in the NFL or, or all those other things, it's okay. As long as Christ is the primary person in your life. If he's number one. And if you're only drawing your self-worth from him. You know what that means? It means that not your, your self-ability, your status, your bank account, or your address are not the primary things you draw your identity from. That you draw your self-worth from. What if God calls some of you to be professional athletes? And it's great you can do that and serve Jesus. But what if you have a career-ending injury? If Jesus is number one, you'll go to another vocation or career, and your self-worth is not lost. Because if it's found in Christ, in Christ alone, then regardless of where God puts you in the great chess game of life, your worth is in Him. Not in what you do for others, not in what you do for yourself, but in who you are in Christ. Let me give you a couple of examples of what that looks like. Many of you have heard of Tim Tebow, and, and I, I almost shudder to use professional starters in a sermon illustration, because every time you do, next week, <laughs> they're in the news for something you would not want to talk about. But I have followed Tim Tebow. And after he no longer had a career in the NFL, you know what I noticed about him? Do you know who was still primarily number one in his life? That's right, Jesus. He went from star to the fun of everybody's joke. You know what I always noticed about his interviews? No matter how much they were ribbing him or making fun of him to get a story, do you know who was number one in his life every time he opened his mouth? I noticed he was here local playing for a, a minor league team. Listen, I've been around some of those stars that made that kind of money. Spent a couple years with those people that made that kind of money. And, and when they would take a fall due to an injury or whatever, They'd wash out. Because their self-worth, their value is gone. But I noticed as they interviewed him on the minor league team, he was the same guy they interviewed several years ago when he was in the spotlight. See, it works two ways. I got a friend who pastors a church up in Charlotte. And they're reaching people. Not church people, lost people. And as they're reaching these lost people, they had this this older biker come in. He's from uh, on up north and he was moved to Charlotte for corning his job. And he happened to come in and give his heart to Jesus. And here's the interesting thing that happened when he came in. He's in his late 50s, 60s maybe. When you think of bikers and every god-awful, immoral, ugly thing that you probably don't want to think about in church this morning, this dude was it. When he gave his heart to Jesus and got saved, just like Tim Tebow, guess who became number one in his life? And the interesting thing is, is he became a missionary at Corning. He set up a Bible study, and everybody saw such a dramatic change in his life. The career was no longer number one in his life. And he set up the Bible study, and guess what was happening at work, at break? Other grown adults that had pursued career, had pursued the bank accounts, had pursued the life of leisure, had pursued everything other than Christ, started to give their heart to Jesus because of the dramatic change they saw in this, this guy. So much so, three weeks ago, they commissioned him like we would commission a missionary going to Africa. They commissioned him a missionary to Corning in Charlotte. <coughs> That's you. You're a missionary. Some of you, it may be professional ball. Some of you, it may be uh, a doctor somewhere or a lawyer somewhere or in Africa or Asia. But all of you have the same call that the missionary over the pond has on their life to a coney. I want you 
want you to think about that for a second. See, that, that biker, Tim Tebow, you know what they know? That I hope and pray that you learn this morning. If you don't know, they know the true meaning of life. The true meaning of life. They know that only peace and joy in life, it can be found chasing a thick skin across some big screen television. It can be found whether or not you drive the nicest car in town. The true joy and peace in life won't be found whether or not you turn heads at the restaurant after service today. True peace and joy in life, it's not going to be found on if you have the right person on your arm. True peace in life and joy, it's not going to be found by where you send out your mortgage, the address from where you send your mortgage payment in every month. The only place the true peace and joy in life can be found is in a real relationship with Jesus. That's right. It's the only place you ever find lasting, stable self-worth. Listen to what Paul said in Colossians 3. If then you have been raised with Jesus or Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on the things that are on the earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Do you understand that I'm saying all of those things? It's not wrong to pursue a career as a professional athlete. It's not wrong to, to want to be successful in life. But who is number one? Because if you're a true believer, your life is hidden in Christ. That means he's the number one priority. Third thing I want you to see is this, finding worth and value from a new identity and a relationship with Jesus. You know, we tell our kids that everyone is special in God's eyes. Is that true? Better question. Now, is it true? Because you say, oh, yeah, Richard, that's true. Yeah. How can it be true? Can you answer that? That everyone is special in God's eyes? Would you listen closely? It's based on who they are, not what they've done, not how they felt in life. See, Genesis tells us in Genesis 1, verses 26 and 27, that we are made in the image of God. That's what makes us all special in God's eyes. Every person is created in God's image. And when you place your trust in Christ, surrender your will for salvation to Him, you become one of God's loved children. Which is a reality that if you don't have your faith in Christ, not, out, not everybody is one of God's children. We are all God's creation. Yeah. Distinction. But what I want you to zero in on this morning is when you place your trade, trust and faith in Him and Him alone, you become one of His beloved children. And He becomes... Then, and only then, your beloved father. He adopts you. Let's talk about adoption this morning. What do you know about adoption? Here's what I know. When Paul wrote this, we're going to read about adoption in Galatians in a moment. In the Roman world, when someone was adopted, they were a permanent child, much like today. I have four kids, you better listen up. I can disown my kids, my, the ones that were born to me, my biological kids. It's not a threat, it's just a fact. <laughs> All right? But you can't disown your adopted child. They're permanent. Paul wrote this, adoption was permanent. When you place your trust and faith in God, he adopts you. He is your permanent father. Listen to what, what the Bible says about adoption in Galatians 3, verses 26. And it's a little bit of length of scripture, but it's well worth it. And this is why I challenge you to bring your Bible. I'm not anti-electronics. The problem with electronics is this. I want you to go to Galatians 3, verse 26. When you go to Galatians chapter 3, verse 26, and we read through chapter 4, verse 7, the Bible's going to define salvation through adoption. 
and you do an underlying adoption, it's hard to do that when you're from. So when later, when you don't feel valued, later when you feel defeated, later when you fail, you can take out old school copy, go back and say, now where was adoption? I got a seminary degree, and I'm like, where was that about? And I start digging for what I've highlighted, what I've underlined, what I've scribbled on. Listen to what the Bible says in Galatians 3.26. For in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized, not water baptism, but saved, baptized, placed in the family, saved, birth into the family, baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, there's neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are in Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, notice the rhetoric there, I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything, but he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you're no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. If you know Christ, you're royal. You've been adopted. You know what that means? Not that it's just you're a son or a daughter of God. It means you have a perfect I don't know about you, but my earthly father, he was less than perfect. You know what else I know? I have four children. I am way less than perfect father. I hope, pray, my kids never try to find their worth through my skills as a father. Nor should you. But if you've been adopted by God, he's the perfect father. You have unchanging security. You have a parent-child relationship. You know what that means? Now listen, this is going to peel back some of your hair. God is no longer your judge. He's your father. Doesn't negate the fact that he has standards. But the relationship between you and God has changed. It means he'll never leave or forsake us. Listen to what the Bible says in Isaiah 49, 15, can a woman forget her nursing child, that she should have no compassion on the sons of her womb? Even these may forget, yet I, this is God, will not forget you. See, the only true place to find joy, peace, and meaning in life, it's to know God. For a relationship with, with Jesus. What does that look like? It looks like walking with Him. I want you to listen closely to this as I explain it to you. What does it mean to walk with God? Abraham, or God told Abraham in the Bible, listen, Genesis 17, 1. He says, I am God Almighty. Walk before me faithfully. To walk before someone in the Bible, or we would say with someone, you and I don't get it. When God told Abraham to walk with me faithfully, we would say walk with someone. We don't understand it because it's a Hebrew idiom. So, Pastor, what's an idiom? <laughs> I don't want to be an idiom, Pastor. That's not what that is, all right? Here's what an idiom is. Let me define it for you. An idiom is a group of words that express a thought. And the group of words are not easily deducted from just the words. If you don't have the context in which the words are used or the culture in which the words are used, you'll miss the meaning. You may, not know what, you, know, you may not know what an idiom is, so therefore that you're not an idiot of an idiom. Let me explain it to you. What does it mean when we say it's raining cats and dogs? You know what that means, don't you? It's an idiom. Let me explain to you what God said to Abraham, what he meant to Abraham, and what he offers to us. 
God said, I am God Almighty. Abraham, walk with me faithfully. It, it means, it meant then and it means today, it means to walk with someone, to befriend someone, to befriend God. It meant to journey with someone face to face. That's the offer God extends. To journey with God face to face it speaks of accountability because they can see the relationship's real. It's not some kind of religious observance, some ritual, some abracadabra prayer you pray. It's a real relationship with a perfect father. There's security and intimacy. To walk with God means that his eyes and his opinions are always on you and only they matter. It means you're not bound what others think of you. How they value you or devalue you. You're not subject to the value that society places on you. If you walk with God. When you stop building your identity on career or even your race, or even your family, or the culture's ideal of how valued you are, and only what God says in a relationship with Him, only then will you experience true freedom. Only then will you experience true peace and joy. See, the only audience that you'll have to perform for then The one who loves us, the one who values us, the one who gave his son for us, the one who appreciates us, provides for us. I want you to listen real close and explain something to you. Many times you'll hear sins preached again, against out of this pulpit. You know why that is? Because our sins show us who's first place in our life and who's not. Sins don't bring value to your life. They bring subtraction, pain, and agony. No one goes to hell for S-I-N-S, plural sins. They only go to hell for the S-I-N, singular sin of rebelling, rejecting God, rejecting Christ. But if there's a lot of S-I-N-S's in your life, the S-O-N is not number one. That's why you hear sin preached again against the pulpit. It's not that you be more moral. It's that you realize who is number one in your life. Because only God can bring back freedom and joy to your life. They take away your attention from Him. The one who desires your attention. Who desires to give you His attention. The only one that can give to you the peace and the security and the joy that you're looking for. The only one that can bring true meaning to life. Jesus said it this way, Mark 8, 36 and 37. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? Think about it this way. To think this through. Those two verses, think about them if I said them this way. What cost of your soul do you find your true identity? Think of it this way. What can he give to buy the, yourself, that self back? See, all of us here this morning are searching. The question is, have you found what you're searching for? We've all in one time or another are searching. If you've never found a true relationship with Jesus Christ, you're still searching. There's always, all of us have been a time in our lives where we were searching to find ourselves. But how much precious life and time are you going to waste searching through culture, searching through vices, searching through wealth, searching through prestige, searching through every all those other things because at the end of the day you'll come up still void and empty. 
you're trying to find yourself, and the only place to find it is through a true relationship with Jesus. Because he's the only one that brings value and worth to you. He's the only one that can save you, forgive you, transform you, and restore you. But here's the thing. I'm not talking about religion. I'm not talking about trying hard. I'm not talking about living moral. If you want to find yourself and find value in your life, here's what you've got to do. You've got to humble yourself. Give up your right to self-determination. You've got to give up control of your life. You've got to surrender your life, your will to Him. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 39, whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. You can't find yourself in culture. You can't find yourself in society. You can't find yourself in your feelings and your emotions, nor religion, nor religious observances. The only place to find your true self, your true worth, Walking with Jesus. Would you bow your heads this morning? Here's what I want to ask you this morning. Not if you've been baptized, not if you're religious, not if you're moral, not if you're a good person. Have no doubt of that. But what I want to ask you this morning is do you have a real relationship with Jesus Christ? Is your relationship real? You might be a good Baptist that won't bring, bring value to your life. The only thing that's going to bring value to your life is a genuine relationship with Jesus. You might be very religious, a good moral person. And see, good moral people have the most difficult time giving their heart to Jesus. It's easy for a, an immoral person to, to realize a lack in their life, but it's more difficult, as Josh has learned, for good moral people in the Bible Belt of the South to realize that their association with religion means nothing. It's valueless to them and valueless to God. The only thing that's valuable is a true, genuine relationship in Christ. And so have you genuinely when God has tucked on your heart, when God has reached out and initiated, tried to start this relationship with you, have you surrendered your will? Have you surrendered your life totally to Him? He said, Lord, I realize that I'm nothing. Have you humbled yourself and come to the point where you realize you have nothing good to bring to the table to offer God? The great thing is, He gave everything still because He loves you. <clears throat> you know, you can remember growing up and going out in a lot of different areas and searching, trying to, to find myself. And all I found was heartache, disappointment at the end of the road. Every, every road I tried. The only place, no matter your age, whether you're a teenager, whether you're a young adult, whether you're middle-aged, whether you've come to the, the last quarter of your life and you realize maybe at the last quarter of your life all those roads that you tried to find worth and significance, into the them, they were empty also. But if you come to Christ, and Christ alone. He'll bring significance, value, and worth, peace, and freedom, and joy that nothing else you've ever tried will. So this morning I'm asking you, not are you religious, not are you moral, not are you wicked, not asking you any of those questions, not are you a Baptist, Presbyterian, Methodist, Catholic, none of those things, not how good you are, and how educated or uneducated, and how much you have at the bank or where you live or who you know, but have you found peace in Christ? 
Have you found peace in Him at the moment? What I want to do just for a second, all eyes are closed. If you can say, preacher, I'm not trusting anything except Jesus Christ. And I have peace and I have value because, preacher, I've been adopted and I know I've been adopted. If you can say that, nobody looking around, raise your hand. Put your hands down for me. You know, if you couldn't say that, the great thing is, is you're here this morning, not by accident or happenstance. You're here because God wants to adopt you into the family. He wants to love on you. He wants to change your life. He wants to bring value to you. He wants you to be a son or a daughter of God. You say, preacher, how do I do that? Now listen, I can lead you through a prayer, but there's no abracadabra about my prayer. My prayer was good for myself. I can give you an illustration. But right now, God's dealing with your heart. What you need to do is have this conversation. This step toward God on your own. You can begin it now. But you need to have it between you and Him. My prayer went something like this. So you can use my example. But God's in heaven right now. Listen. Say, Lord, Lord, I realize today that I'm lost. Yet I realize all the things that I counted as important. God, they're not going to give me some reward in the end or help me get into heaven. God, I realize today I need a personal relationship with you. Lord, I'm asking you to come into my heart, to take my life, all of them and change them. God, use however you see fit. In Christ's name, amen. This morning as we stand to worship, if you have begun a relationship with Christ, we want to pray with you. We want to celebrate with you. We'd ask you to come forward that I might know and we could rejoice with you. But if that's too much and overwhelming at this point, I understand that. I wasn't raised in the church until I understand that. Catch me outside. Catch one of our deacons. One of our members. Maybe God is calling you to come and be baptized. You've given your heart to Jesus and you want to follow Him in obedience because you love Him because He first loved you. Maybe come join our church and serve this community. Be missionaries to this community. Whatever it is God's calling you to do. Let's respond this morning out of joy and freedom because we know Him who loves us. Let's stand this morning and worship.